Good morning. My name is Nicolas Estrada, and I'm working in uh, one of the Middle Earth thematic projects under the main supervision of uh, Dr. Doug Tingham and um, Dr. Taus Jurgensen and Dr. Jeff Marsh. Um, I graduated from my bachelor's degree in geology from AFE University in Colombia back in 2017 and later got the opportunity in the fall of 2018 um, to be part of this thematic project, which is focused in the tectorothermal history of the Capus case in structural zone, and also assessing the metal behavior during high-grade metamorphism. So my goal with uh, today's presentation is to give you an overview of the project and their relevance of conducting it within the overall Middle Earth uh, initiative. So before starting, I just want to thank our project research and funding partners that without them, as all you know, uh, none of this fund research uh, will be possible. So thank you so much. Now to keep some um, kind of order in the presentation, um, it will consist in the following. So first I want all of you to be on the same uh, page and see what are the goals of this research and what kind of general implications it has. Uh, followed by putting all of us in context on where the campus casing is located and what makes it so relevant. And then later I will show you some of the results and the direction this will take us to finalize with a strong mention to the upcoming work. So Metal Earth general goal is to understand processes that result in the early earth metal endowment and how can they be recognized. So with this in mind, which is the Capus Casing Structure Zone, to first identify and characterize the extraction of metals during partial melting. Second, to understand the nature, timing, and duration of those tectorothermal processes of the mid-lower crust. And third, understand how those processes in the lower crust temporarily relate to the metamorphism hydrothermal alteration and gold deposits formation in the ABTV um, sub-province. So by seeking to answer those fundamental questions in the campus casing, we are able to address uh, three main general aspects, which are um, the mantle and crystal scale fluid pathways, the Archean tectonics and metallogeny, and the fluid and melt and metal sources. Now, the, this research is more emphasizing, emphasizing in the latter one, but uh, taking advantage of the geological setting uh, to have a look to the Archean tectonics and fluid pathways as well. Okay, so to be all on the same page, from a regional perspective, the Capus Casing structure is located in the southeastern part of the Superior Province. It um, is an uplifted portion of the cross that is fault bonded to the east with the Abitibis Province by the Ivanhoe Lake Fault and to the west with the Wawasu province by the Saganash Lake Fold. So the Capus Casing structure exposes a variety of rocks from up to 35 kilometers in depth, 30 to 35 kilometers in depth, such as uh, mygmatized mafignases, subordinate parnases, and tonalites. So the Capus Casing geological setting represents a unique opportunity to conduct this research because there's no many places in the world where lower crystal rocks are exposed and probably none that are adjacent to a metal and doubt belt, such as the Abitibis province. And that at the same time, host a gold deposit like the Borden Belt deposit, as we can see from the map that is highlighted in the yellow um, star. So let's have a look to a generalized schematic cross section of a crystal block where we have the Abitibis province with rocks at green schist and fibrillate phase schist and the Capus Casing structural zone with higher metamorphic grains. So I want to illustrate here the relationship of some processes that may have operated in the lower crust and processes that have been proposed for elsewhere. So the Phillips and, Fa and, and Powell's model, um, the Phillips and Powell's present a metamorphic dehydration model for low to mid metamorphic grade that explains enrichment segregation, also the timing and distribution as, uh, of many gold fields, where mafic rocks, which have been high graded, are metamorphosed at crystal conditions through a temperature interval of about 500 to 600, 620, 620 degrees, 
releasing tons of fluids and where those uh, where the rock is completely reconstituted during metamorphic uh, reactions. So in that process, all the gold that is in the rock can be exposed in the metamorphic fluid. And if the and in and with the right composition, it has the potential to mobilize metals upwards to higher crystal levels. Some of those rocks in the caps casing may have already gone through this, but others are deep that are potentially deeper in cross crystal levels have not. So there is another process that can operate at higher metamorphic metamorphism at the amphibolite to granulite phases transition, where you can actually start to partially melt the rock at deeper crystal levels and higher temperatures. And the question here um, is then, are those metals, are the metals in the host rock at the point in time in the lower cross, which can be liberated through partial melting of the rock and be carried off by silicon metals derived from that lower crust? So let's just have a um, closer look to that. So here's a sequential sketch of that greenish system fibrillate fishes when uh, a mafic rock is strongly hydrated before it goes through the transition towards higher metamorphic grade. Amphibolite phases, the reaction here will represent nearly a complete reconstitution of the rock during metamorphic recrystallization. So the majority of minerals at that moment in the rock will consume in the reaction pr producing new minerals and therefore gold that may be present in the rock has then the opportunity to become exposed to metamorphic fluids that will then have the right composition to transfer that gold. However, if the rock was strong, not strongly hydrated, it may have not experienced that complete rock reconstitution reaction at lower grades, leaving some of those silicate minerals that may carry metals of interest to be present at higher metamorphic grades. So if we continue to granulate phases, we observe that some of those amphibolite plagioclase still present and take part in possible melting reactions, such as the horrible plagioclase quartz producing garnet CPX liquidus, or the horrible garnet quartz producing some OPX plagioclase melt, where minerals would continue to break down, allowing metals to potentially mobilize or get even trapped in those protective phases. So this leaves us with a question. Is partial melting another scenario where we can release metals from the crust and transfer them by a melt phase followed by a fluid phase. And to see if this is the case, we have conducted the following work. We have complete two field seasons in the first one in 2018 and the Chapel block located in the Southern area where there is mafic rocks with a gradational change from fibrillate to granulate facies um, towards the Northeast and abundant tunnelites. And a second field season in 2019 at the Groundhog River block, where most rocks are mafic migmatites and parnices. So, a detailed mapping of some of those migmatite aircrafts was elaborated and sampled for thin sections work, and whole rock characterizations were collected and, and sent. Along with those petrology work, samples for geochronology were also submitted, and they include some of the different migmatite components in the northern area. Uh, some parnases and a few tunnelites. The data is being processed at this moment. Um, so now I would like to focus your attention to the mafic migmatite in the northern area, um, around where the yellow star is located in the map, uh, since the following two outcrops that are good rep representations of what we observe in the field. So here is um, what we have. Here we have outcrop 154. Uh, which is a layer of migmatite and um, to the left you will see some acro pictures and to the right you will see some of the sketches. So in green we are observing an amphibole ridge which is mostly retrograde amphibole, uh, some plagioclase, some clinoperoxin subdomains that is interpreted as the rest type. In gray we have a plagioclase quartz plus or minus some garnet and amphibole interpreted as the leucosome um, and as you can observe from the figure, smaller in situ leucosomes are concordant with the outcrop of foliation, foliation and basically forms a stromatic migmatite structure. So the melt mode uh, is increases here and then uh, get to mobilize along, and then the melt gets to mobilize along the foliation to form a leucocratic network. This becomes discordant with the foliation, as you can see from the picture, 
And it's also important to notice that some of this leukosome is closely related to um, some garnet porphyroblasts, which are interpreted as a garnet crystallizing from the melt, from the, uh, as a peritectic garnet. Um, sorry. And um, the lighter um, and in, in the lighter pink uh, layer, we have a garnet plagioclase, CPX, OPX, with some sulfides as a pyrite, cacopyrite, and pyrotide, which is interpreted as in, an in-source leukosome. And with in-source leukosome, I'm referring to crystallized melt that has migrated away from the places where it formed, but it's still within the confines of its source layer. So moving forward, um, sorry, this doesn't wanna, okay. So moving forward, we have here the, like an example of the hand samples that we collect for these different, for the different uh, subdomains. So as you can see in the upper, in the upper one, there's a clear uh, relations of the rest side uh, with the in situ leukosome and those uh, peritectic garnets. So it's a nice and clear uh, relation. And then if you see on the bottom part of it, um, there is a sample of the in-source leukosome with the adjacent, adjacent um, restite. And as you can observe the, um, between the, the margins of the in-source leukosome and the restite, we have like coarser OPX. And in the in-source leukosomes, we have uh, peritectic garnets closely related with those sulfides and retrograde amphiboles. Now, if we take these uh, samples and we clean them well and try to just submit for the different, for whole rock for the different um, migmatite domains, we come across the following plot. So here we have uh, gold in the X axis and copper in the Y axis, both in a PPM. And these are preliminary geochemical observations where you see some difference in gold and copper content in those different migmatite components. Um, there is a slightly higher value, um, slightly highly, highly values are observed in the in-source leukosomes compared to the rest sites. And uh, however, the original attempt was to do a larger suite of analysis on high precision metals, but Due to the, the situation hasn't been possible, but there's been and, and is, there's been a delay on that part of the work. But uh, we are now looking to get on getting higher precision analysis from a commercial lab to expand that data set. So where are those sulfides? And have let's have a closer look to that. So if we take that sample um, that we have here and we and we see the distribution of those sulfides. We can observe in these two thin sections that on this uh, top right corner, no, not much sulfides in the rest side, but in the overall, like um, in, 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 in source leukosome next to the peritectic garnets, those sulfides are closely re related, right? Um, so those sulfides plates are not only closely related to the um, silicates, but are kind of like wetting those silicates. So you can see here, and most importantly, they are also um, they, they, they are also observed as inclusions in those uh, peritectic garnets, and this is uh, really neat because it means that the sulfides were present at the time those peritectic garnets grew, and it gave us the potential to try to understand those peritectic garnets and the metamorphic reactions that they were involved in to build a coherent story on when and how those sulfides um, were mobilized and crystallized and melt. So this is, this is when it becomes important to conduct detailed metamorphic uh, work, not only for the sulfide perspective, but also for the um, evolution and understanding of the metamorphic processes in the caps casing. And to just have a closer look to that, we jump here to outcrop 138 and, and as well in the northern um, caps casing area, where uh, you can see from the pictures that the outcrop has the same or similar relationships to the last outcrop. Uh, here, the purple layer represents the restite, and the light yellow represents the mesosome, 
and the darker yellow represents an in situ luxon. So if we take a sample from the square B, which will be a sample from here, we will, we will get this hand sample. Um, a really good example of all three subdomains that are observed as well in the aircraft. So you have the rest that here, the melanosome will be this here, and then you have the luxum. Same features that are observed in the thin section. Um, now, I'm doing some analysis and detailed petrography. We get here um, some X-ray maps for subsolidus and peritectic garnets, and we can observe that there is some growth zoning for calcium in those peritectic garnets, but not in the subsolidus garnets. And with the variability in chemistry between the different subdomains, I have modeled the whole rock, the melt, the effective pool composition by extracting some of the melt that is produced. And what I'm showing you here um, is a summary, uh, summary of the pressure temperature pseudo section diagram of that bull rock composition that I am constructing with the thermodynamic data and the mineral chemistry analysis. And that show us that the peak metamorphism is about at 11 kilobars and goes down rapidly in pressure at a still a high temperature to about eight kilobars and 850 degrees Celsius. But this still an in pro and a progress, uh, but work in progress that still needs some refinement. Now, if we jump to the work done in the felsic rocks, um, we have supercrucial felsic gneisses, um, volcanic and volcanic classic derived from the Borden Lake belt with an east stringent direction overlying a mafic dominated volcanic rock package that underwent amphibolite fishes metamorphism. So the pictures I'm about to uh, show you from the air crop come from where the uh, red star, uh, the yellow star is located. So here you can see the like a nice uh, felsic outcrop where you, you have mainly two subdomains. One, a fine-grained uh, rock, which is composed of biotite plagioclase uh, quartz and plus or minus some muscovite, which is interpreted as the restite, and a coarser grain rock, which is composed of muscovite as uh, plagioclase quartz plus or minus some biotite that becomes concordant and discordant to defoliation in some places. As you can see here, there's bigger discord, uh, concordant um, layers and they become discordant overall in the outcrop. And those are interpreted to be leukocratic networks. So if you go and we do the same exercise as we did it for the mafic outcrops and we take uh, samples from the leukocratic network and the rest side, we come across the following plot. Now, the difference between um, the different um, copper and gold content here is not as higher as we, you see in the mafic, but there's still a, lot, a slightly elevated gold content in those uh, leukocratic networks. Um, the idea with this is to continue to um, link it with the geochronology that's that it's in um, progress right now to try to date those melts and correlate it with the different metamorphic reactions to try to understand if that partial melting uh, is heavily related to muscovite dehydration or if there is like a, a water saturation in the rock that uh, is producing more of those of those melts. Now the upcoming work is um, basically oriented in understanding the behavior of those cold silver base metals and lower melt calcophile elements in silicate minerals of mafic magmatized components um, using some of the trace element mineral chemistry by doing um, trace element maps in the garnets, whether they are subsolidus and supersolidus and compare them and some of the other silicate, melt, silicate minerals involved in the partial melting reactions, such as um, pyroxenes and um, amphiboles. Then we just want to refine the PT conditions across the northern cap as the first step towards understanding that metamorphic evolution across the area and improving, keep, keep improving the modeling of those mafic and felsic migmatites to use it as a tool to evaluate the evolution of the cap casing. 
Thank you so much. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Great, thanks very much, Nicholas. Um, are there any questions? I got one quick, Ross. Mm -hmm. So Nicholas, um, have you guys considered looking at the um, copper gold content in those sulfide blebs? Um, obviously the whole rock values are very low, but I'd be interested to see uh, what the concentrations are in, in, in those minerals. Yeah, we have uh, just with the uh, timing, like on my preparation of the samples and what the COVID-19 has been and yeah, the issues at the university just has been a bit hard to get those analyses, but we are scheduled to, to do those trace element analyses on the sulfites as well as uh, those same silicates and the protective garments and that. Great, thanks. Uh, Nicolas, Georges Baudouin speaking. Um, what method exactly you use for the very low gold uh, grade analysis? So uh, initially, uh, the intention was to do the analysis with uh, Pitcairn, um, that he has done some uh, lower concentration, some low gold concentration analysis in um, similar, similar rocks. So initially, that was the intention to do it with him. He has developed a method for that, but um, because of the situation we are we are now uh, sending the uh, the the rocks to ALS, and they have uh, a package that analyzes for this uh, stuff. Okay, so this is ALS low uh, gold grade uh, package. No, no, yeah, the ALS has the develop a. Uh, uh, low concentration gold analysis. And uh, so we're submitting the pulps to them and, and they're following on that. Okay. Uh, George, this is Doug here. So, you know, those analyses are part of the main uh, litho geochem package that's used. Um, so they are not the uh, low, low uh, concentration analysis. Um, yeah, he was originally gonna go uh, and do it with Ian Pitt Karen, but he was gonna have to travel over to Europe to do that. Um, we couldn't get it in. Um, and I am told that ALS has a, lo a low concentration package. So we're probably looking at submitting a larger suite of samples to this ALS low concentration package. Okay, so probably we should um, coordinate because Diogo will be also comparing the results we have from um, uh, powders that were analyzed from the Pontiac and the uh, volcanic rocks of the Superior and the uh, two recent papers we had in geology. Uh, to compare the, um, the let's call it pit care method with the uh, ALS package so that we uh, can uh, have a, a little quality control on the uh, very low grade um, uh, measurements. Okay, that sounds good. I'll, I'll talk to you. We'll talk offline about that and make a decision. Yeah, yeah, yeah good. Any further questions? Sure, I, I have a very quick question. Um, the, the gold at uh, Borden Lake is um, associated with spatially with pegmatites. Um, I'm just curious if you looked at uh, pegmatite compositions as part of helping to unravel the story. Um, so we, we haven't, we have collecting some samples of the pegmatites, but I haven't looked into pegmatite compositions yet. Uh, in, 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 like the intention will be after um, nailing down the mineral reactions and what's actually producing that melt, that those melts uh, in the Borden area will be to follow up on those pegmatites, um, but, but I haven't seen it yet. Okay, yeah, I just think they might uh, made help sort of understand the, uh, the evolution of the whole process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much, Nicholas. Um, we're a little ahead of schedule here, so we're gonna take five minutes and then uh, we'll go on to a, uh, a series of presentations on the VMS thematic uh, orchestrated by Harold Gibson. All right. <laughs>